Episode 83 of Outlander Cast is brought to you by StoryWorth. Please visit storyworth.com slash outlander to save $20 when you subscribe. And suddenly, there it was. Craig Nadoon. My mind had been so clouded and confused, I didn't recognize the road when we rode in. There was no mistaking it. I was back to the place where it had all begun. So much had happened, so much had changed. Last I was here, I was Claire Randall, then Claire Beecham, then Claire Fraser. The question was, who did I want to be? All the way from Cranston, Rhode Island, welcome to Outlander Cast. It's a podcast dedicated to the show Outlander on Stars. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Mary Larson. My name is Blake, and I think it's been a long time since we have done this many episodes in such a short time span. I think it's been a week, I think so, right around there. You know, it feels good. It feels good. We, of course, have been spending a lot of our time as podcasters doing the Living Reminders, a show about our leftovers, but now the leftovers is done, and I'm ready to talk some more Outlander. I know. Now finally we're able to to dedicate a lot of time to Outlander. And when we did the last episode, um, I really had a lot of fun and it was actually a lot of great feedback about that episode, about our conversation uh, for the in-depth study of Sassanok, what it meant and what was there. So I was actually really inspired by that episode and I decided, well, why don't we do one for both sides now? Uh, we started one for the beginning of season one. Let's do the mid-season finale mm-hmm. of season one as well. And we can see where Outlander traveled from, where where it began, where it went to, and then where it ended, at least at the midpoint. And once we had discovered that, then we can either go back to do the wedding or we could go back and do, um, you know, the the... The way out, or we could do any other episode, or we could go forward and do the next finale, um, like to ransom a man. So we can go anywhere, but as long as we have this beginning point, mm-hmm. we can do anything we want. And if people keep liking it, hey, we'll keep making them. Whatever, <laughs> what the hell, <laughs> screw it. So uh, yeah, I was, I, w- I was pretty, I'm pretty excited by this. You know, like you said, last episode is about starting. Starting a show, starting to learn and to love these characters that we love so awfully much, starting basically on a journey. We discussed the differences between, um, you know, the the measured approach of the pilot in the model of television Mm -hmm. and the more risky but guaranteed to be told series premiere model. So we Mm -hmm. broke that down for you. So in that exploration, we learned about the structure of how an episode is written and how the Outlander showrunner Ron Moore, we love him, Justin <laughs> Ron, utilized that structure in an unorthodox ways to better favor a sweeping story that he had to introduce within 60 minutes. No easy feat. No <laughs> easy feat. However, today is all about moments. That's correct. Today's moments are what are pivotal to the plot. There are moments that are pivotal, pivotal to the, the show itself, but most importantly, moments that are absolutely pivotal to the characters that we're watching on television. And as big and as sweeping mm-hmm. as the first, uh, the series premiere has to be, as Sassanok was, this episode was relatively tame. It was relatively small so we want to get into that and 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 then and then um discuss what 
this episode means as a whole for Outlander, right? Okay, so while we get into those moments, we first need to really dig down into both sides now and its function in Outlander as a whole. All right, let's get into it. All right, so episode one was all about getting to know the characters, getting to know the plot, the the setting, getting to know all of those things. And this episode, Both Sides Now, it serves as the eighth episode of season one. And unlike the premiere, Both Sides Now has to operate on many different levels, all of which could make it collapse at any moment, really. So for those watching it during its live run, both sides has to function as a mid-season finale, so it has to be epic in scope and its writing and its direction. It has to look beautiful. It has to live up to what has been created beforehand. It also has to close up any minor plot threads Mm. and tell a satisfying story that will keep us satiated until the second half arises. Uh, you know, of course, there's those people who, lucky ducks, they get to binge it now, or heck, even 10 years from now. I am so jealous <laughs> of those people. So Both Sides Now is nothing more to those people as the middle episode of a 16-part series. Correct. They'll never know that season one was split at this moment for nearly a half a year. All of us remember. <laughs> right. We remember. <laughs> so it, it can't be too big because uh, otherwise it it, it sticks out from the rest yes. of the story as, as a major distraction. And it also has to leave us with enough of a plot thread dangling down so that we can't wait to hit play on the next episode. So lastly, while I think this is vastly overlooked, I think it's the fact that it had to follow up on what I consider to be the most anticipated episode of Outlander yet, which was The, the Wedding. wedding. So Ron and company had every opportunity to to like basically pack it in, right? They what had every like <laughs> pack what in to pack it in. Like when you when um when you're giving up, you pack it in. They 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 could let the wedding be the standout highlight of season one A. It was for both the live <laughs> and the binge viewers. You think it really was? That was well, a standout wet episode. I mean. I was really excited about it. I still really love it. (laughs) I don't know. I love the wedding. Well, either way, coming off that emotional and and visionary high of the wedding, it could easily be a trap for anyone creatively. They could just be like, okay. Yeah, they could have totally coasted, you know, except the problem was that they had to, what, like double down and make sure that the series actually kept going throughout the first season. Not that the that the highlight would be the wedding, but they need to really kind of focus on her survival rather than just love making. (laughs) And but also it, it had to double down on the subversion of what they accomplished. What? In. The wedding episode. Remember, I tried to use that word double down. Look at you copying me. What are you trying to say? You know, okay, fine. What I maybe I did copy, but it, it's subversion. Subversion. Like you're getting fancier than me. That's what you're trying to do. They 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 subverted your expectations. You expected one thing and you got a completely different other thing. Remember in the wedding They did when, a quick change on you. When, remember in the wedding when all of a sudden the the episode opens and they're already married? And you're like, what the yes. heck? You're like, what? Yes, okay. Okay, they subverted the expectation. They mm-hmm. told a completely non-linear story, mm-hmm. which was great. It was awesome. Yes. And in this episode, they subverted your expectation because, yes, they they had to talk about what the series and what it actually makes it tick in the first season, which is Claire's survival. But also, they by subverting it, they're talking about the moral quandary of her double life. And you better believe that in a little bit we'll get more into this moral quandary that she finds herself in. So ultimately, like the premiere, though, Ron does have a lot to accomplish in a short span of about 60 minutes once again. 
Uh, all of these issues have to be addressed, but in a fashion that is pleasing to all of its fans, both all past, present, and even future fans. Oh my he God. has to satisfy the people that are watching it at that moment and making it a mid-season premiere, I mean, a mid-season finale, but he also has to, like I said, get enough of a story in the middle of the season for those who are watching it later on so that it doesn't distract and it doesn't take away from the rest of the season. I never thought about that. Right? I know. Poor and, Ron. And it is my distinct pleasure to say that both sides now, upon more viewings, knowing what we know about the show now, it walks this line with ease and near perfection. Well done, Ron Moore. In fact, I would argue that Both Sides Now contains all of the elements that are required for a perfect episode of Outlander, which in this case is mysticism. Okay. Love. Yeah. Humor. Yeah. Action. Tension. And the ever important emphasis on location. He has all of them. Um, I, I, I remember who we, wrote it. This is Ron Moore. Oh, he wrote this episode. He wrote this episode. Well, there you go. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but he also wrote Sassanok, too. So, I mean, that, that that is where it is. I mean, Sassanok was difficult because it was a, a hard episode to introduce mm. every single little thing. Right? Who else was on his team? Who, like, directed this uh, both sides now? This is Anna Forster. Oh, boom. There you go. See? Boom. <laughs> mic drop. Ron Moore writes and Anna Forrester directs. Right. Done. So we're, we're going to get into that too as well. But, you know, a- again, like I said, I, I, I think the, the success of this episode is due to the writing. It's due to Ron Moore. And, he, and, and I really feel like he does an admirable job uh, of keeping a light pace throughout the episode when he inserts and ejects us, the viewer, from... You know, the 1740s and the 1940s and puts us in and out and it has great transitions of, you know, swiping of the water and taking in drinks. And and when he's going back and forth from time to time, generally what's happening is as he's transitioning, the people that are on screen are doing the same thing at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it makes you feel connected that they're all living a parallel life at that very moment. Crazy. Time travel is crazy. <laughs> but really, in my estimation, and as you talked about on the Forrester, both sides now really works because of Anna Forrester. She's magic, man. She is magic. You're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> You're a wizard, Harry. So she... I feel like she just seems to understand each character. What, what, oh, yeah. what motivates them. What, what pains them. And even what pushes them forward mm-hmm. on screen. And most importantly, and I, I really appreciate this, she has the eye of a person who is a major motion picture filmmaker. I, I, I know she has directed a lot of television, but she has this specific eye because she has worked on all of uh, the movies, like the the, the um, disaster films, like Independence Day, mm-hmm. you know, uh, or uh, 2012, she, she, you know, she is the director of photography, a director of photography for all those films. Yeah, she gets it. She understands what it takes to have a good composition in the frame, mm-hmm. and she understands how to make an evocative picture, tell its story. So that gives credence, in my opinion, to the story that she is telling, and also it gives legitimacy. To the story that Ron Moore is trying to tell in these other episodes. How bonkers is that? Two storytellers that have to eventually tell the same story. Right. And do it in their own different ways. You know, Ron, he, he granted, he has written a couple of movies and Star Trek The Next Generation being one of them. Uh, but he's a TV guy. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. That's what that's what he's there for. That's that's what that's he's why, yeah. You know? And Anna Forster here is coming from Hollywood, and and she's kind of a, a she's kind of big time, yeah. You know, for the most part, within within they the community, they both are big time, but they're in very different, yeah, within veins. the community, yeah. So different veins, different styles, and here they have to meet up and tell this one story, and that's why I think this episode is 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 magic and why it works so well. And here is another thing that we don't really talk about either. She directs the wedding. I know. See, I'm so, just giving her props all around. Right, she is a powerhouse. Like she, she is. She gets it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 
<sighs> I just, I, I love Anna Forster. I, I <laughs> so one of the things that I remember, and sweetheart, I remember we, we actually just talked about this, was we, we just finished The Leftovers, the, the series, and we had the absurd honor of interviewing Damon Lindelof for our podcast, The Live Reminders. But one of the things that he said that really stuck to me was he made a point to highlight what he thought to be one of the most important factors in creating television, which was identity. Mm. You know, despite being the showrunner of probably, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this but for all the Outlander fans, but what I think to be probably the greatest drama told within the past decade, he admitted, this is Damon Lindelof, he admitted that he didn't quite know what the show wanted to be during season one until he brought on Mimi Leader. Mm Mm-hmm. And oh, Mimi Leader is just another, oh my God. Powerhouse. A powerhouse in my heart. Like, oh. Mimi Leader was brought on to be a director in episode five. Yes. In fact, after he watched the dailies for episode five, and then eventually the episode itself, he fell so in love with what Mimi had done, the tone, the tenor, and all the emotional payoffs that came out of that show, he recognized that that was the first time he actually felt the way he he didn't even know he wanted to feel Mm -hmm. about that show. And he knew instantly, this is what I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. This is the show. And it's all because of Mimi Leader and her impact and her direction. So he brought her on as producer and what eventually amounted to be, as he described, as a essentially a co showrunner. Okay, so you're talking about out you're talking about leftovers, but we're talking about Outlander. So how does this relate? Right. And I bring this up because Anna Forster, I, I think, in my opinion, is Outlander's version of Mimi Leader. She gets Outlander. She understands ah, gotcha. Outlander. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I, she gets it visually. I think she gets it emotionally. I think she gets it aesthetically. She gets it compositionally. All of it. In fact, I, and this is going to sound so arrogant. Tell me. But I'm pretty sure Ron Moore would agree with me, too. I'm pretty sure <laughs> if he were sitting right here, right now with us, he would yeah. say, Blake, you're right. And I say that <laughs> because he brought in Anna to direct four of the most pivotal episodes in Outlander to date, in my opinion. List them off for me. The Wedding. Yep. Both Sides Now. Yep. Wentworth. Yep. Terrence of a Man's Soul. Yeah, yes. Th- those are the most pivotal episodes of Outlander yet. I can't think. I, I challenge a listener to tell me a more pivotal episode than those. Hmm. Uh, and, and if you have one, great. Tell me, and, I, and I'll, I'll be glad to talk about it. But when you think about it, consider the story and the emotional impact of the characters to which she was entrusted. Oh, I'll throw you something. What? How about this? Two characters who don't even really know each other's names, mm-hmm. and then they... Fall in love and we believe it. Right. They fall in one night. <laughs> one night. Think of that. They don't I even know. That, I don't that, even know your name. <laughs> they fall in love. They get married. They get married before they fall in love. Then they have awkward sex, then good sex, and then like hot sex. Yes. And they fall in love all in one night. And then they have that love challenged to its core, sell the investment of Frank, and then introduce the conflict between BJR. Claire and Jamie, the next freaking episode in Both Sides Now. That is so many plot points. I know. And Holy then, smokes. of course, then we run into what's possibly the most controversial episodes that television has ever produced mm-hmm. with Wentworth mm-hmm. and To Ransom a Man's Soul. Yep. And while that is important, let's not forget that Forrester has to accomplish emotionally for Jamie and Claire that will eventually provide the affecting backbone of the entire next season. Oh, y- you know what? When Forrester gets a hands on it, Outlander sings. <laughs> yes, it does. She was entrusted with the emotional core of the entire first season and the foundation of the next season. The emotional core of the, 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 the conflict with Blackjack Randall, Jamie, and Claire. Falling in love. Mm-hmm. Breaking down that love. Having the, the PTSD that Jamie did. Setting them up to go to France. All of it. All in one director's hands. It's crazy. 
So to be honest, my real hope is that she would be able to come on full time like Mimi Leader did with the leftovers. But of course, Anna, being amazing as she is, she has new responsibilities, including directing the Underworld sequel that mm-hmm. just recently mm-hmm. came out, which is uh, why she couldn't rejoin Outlander in season two. So bummed. But also Source Code too, that other movie that's coming out. The one remember Jake Gyllenhaal the, the on Source the Code on the train. She's directing. She's directing the sequel to that. Okay. Which is probably why she won't won't return for season three. Much to my dismay. <sighs> Anna, we so, need to. But regardless, our goal here is to break down both sides now. So. I, yeah. What the I, heck? I, Let's I, do this, please. And and I think, like I said, for the past episode, it it it. it it was dependent upon how the episode was broken down and we went through all the acts and we mm-hmm. did all that. In my opinion, f- today, for this episode, it all boils down to one moment. One moment? Claire looks out into the mist and unexpectedly sees rocks. The rocks that brought her so much joy and pain and comfort and discomfort and love and confusion. <gasps> say, how do you say it? Craig Nadoon. Oh, look at you. You worked on how to say it this time. <laughs> See, I was, I was a little apprehensive there. And I'm brought back to what we played at the beginning of this episode, Claire's voiceover. I was back to the place where it all begun. So much had happened. So much had changed. And last time I was here, I was Claire Randall, then Claire Beecham, then Claire Fraser. The question was, who did I want to be? And while we had established that the premise of the show in our previous podcast episode was Claire, or a powerful self-reliant nurse, is sent back through the time because she touches mysterious stones in a highly superstitious area, the question of who Claire wants to be is the emotional through line of the show, not just the premise. It's the heart around which everything we watch is based. What do you mean? Well, is she Claire Randall? Is she Claire Fraser? Yes, yes. Or is she both? Yes, that was easy. Well, does she really have to make a choice? And if so, what does that choice mean to to her, to, to Jamie, to Frank? But most importantly, what does that choice say about Claire? Is this the woman who fell through the stones, one we that we immediately gravitated to in the premiere? Or is she a woman lost in the spinning veil of time? Hmm. Or on a more gripping note, is she a morally ambiguous at best character that chooses what's best for her regardless of the promises she makes or the roles she undertakes in her split lives? This is why Claire Fraser, Randall Beecham, whatever the hell you want to call her, works so well. When she's staring off into the mist, looking Mm -hmm. at stones, it's this very moment. Because not only does she have to decide who she wants to be, but it allows the viewer to relive all of the moments that have come before. All the feels. And make their own decision on who they want Claire to be. They don't even know. They don't even know. They don't know. Actually, they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, she stares off into that mist. <laughs> they all do. With, with a huge field separating herself from herself. Hmm. I mean, two men, two lives, two oh. homes. Oh, it's so difficult. I know. I mean, oh, oh no. God, the, the, the horror, you know, the love of two men calling to you. But they, it is in, in, inevitably calling to her. And as we stare with her, we're left suspended in time. Oh my gosh. Yes, we are. Our hopes, yep. our, our, our wants, our yes. dreams. Yes. They're all ascribed to this very moment in Claire's life. But I was confused at that moment. I felt like uh, I was torn because of all the Frank. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, with Claire, we're, we're hopeful, we're, we're scared, we're, we're taunted, really. By what is and what was, what what could have been, and really what will be Uh, for Outlander. Is this normal? (laughs) Right? And despite the wide sprawl of land and the endless trek that it seems to be for us and Claire, Ron Moore and Anna Forrester have achieved the most important part of the show so far. What? 
we, the uh-huh. audience, yes, as we look out at those stones with Claire, mm-hmm. we are fully engaged. One hundred percent. What like even the book readers. Given Ron's propensity to change the original material. Yeah, we were like, what is going on? Right. Why is Frank here? Why is Frank here? Why am I even watching any of this? Why can they hear each other a little bit? The book readers are entirely unsure about what's to come next. Frank! Will, <laughs> will Claire run? Frank! Will she stay? Even if she does run. No, no, no I'm giving you what? the opportunity here to go, Frank, again. Oh, Frank! <laughs> even if she does run... <laughs> Will it be successful? Are we even thinking at all about her being captured by red codes? And the answer, of course, is no. We are in the moment with Claire. Yep. We're watching Claire. We're emotional like Claire. We're reluctant like Claire. And we're scared like Claire. But because this is the show's most important moment, you want to know why it's the show's most important moment? In season 1A? No, no. So far. Okay. So far. Yes. Why? What? Because. Wait, what? I'm so yeah. confused. You're saying this is the most important moment, period? In period, so far. Guaranteed. You think it is? Guaranteed. Why? Why? Well, we'll get into that in a minute. What? But it is the most important moment. Why? For, for the entire show. Why? Because at this moment in time, we are Claire, the viewer. And make no mistake about it. It really is the turning point of the show. And here's why. If Claire doesn't choose to run and she sticks with Willie and indirectly Jamie, Mm -hmm. she isn't caught by Blackjack Randall, doesn't have to be rescued by Jamie at Fort William, which doesn't set off the course of personal events that occur between Blackjack Randall and Jamie, Jamie culminating in Wentworth, which doesn't lead to France, oui, oui. which doesn't lead to their plan to stop the Jacobite Rebellion, Honeypot. which doesn't lead to Claire having to go back to Frank at the end of season two with an unborn baby because she hadn't killed Dougal, uh, and she and Jamie wouldn't have put themselves in the spot they did that required her to go back for her safety. Like, None of that happens without Claire looking at these stones and making a choice. Yes. So because of this, this right now is the story. This moment, Claire looking out right here, right now. But here's the problem. Mm -hmm. Ron and the writers and Anna, they have to earn the moment. Okay. They, you, you can't just write something like this and expect the viewer to just accept it. And care. And care. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Right. All of what come what has come before is it's all well and good. I mean, even my favorite episode, the Garrison Commander, it's it's a good episode. Mm-hmm. The wedding, Sassnock, the gathering, Rent, Castle Leoc, the way out, all of it. It's all it's all cute. But for the show, cute. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 good. It's interesting. It's it's fun to watch. It's okay, cute. it's, it's okay, good. Yeah. But for the show to function on its highest level. We need this moment of uncertainty and doubt and uh, eventual resolve from Claire. Meaning, there actually has to be a choice for Claire. Mm -hmm. The viewer has to believe that Claire is indeed divided between Frank and Jamie. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, the problem is, is that um, she's... (laughs) <laughs> How can you? There's literally like it's Jamie. Yes, Jamie is the king of men. Yes, I I know that there are book readers just like you, my darling, that are saying it's Jamie. There is no choice. I love Jamie. He is the king of men. Yes, I no, get that. No contest. It, 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 right. Yes, he is all of that. And yes, that is that is that's good for you, the book readers. Mm-hmm. But you, the book readers, have to accept two things, in my opinion. One. You didn't choose Frank as your partner in the beginning like Claire did. She chose him to get married. Claire doesn't have the foreknowledge that you do of her life because of books. Yeah. And you are not, let's get honest here, you're not stuck in the truly dangerous setting of the 1740s as you read the book. So the stakes aren't real time for for you, the reader. We're pretty much the Mrs. Grahams of Outlander. Right. (laughs) So, So number two, 
the show, and I, this is a direct result of number one, the show has to be written as though the books don't exist to the viewer, except in nice little nods, like, uh, oh, the, the, the wolf howling at mm-hmm. Wentworth, right? Mm-hmm. Nice little nod. I'm glad I told you about that. I know, me too. <laughs> you were like, why is there a wolf? Oh, Liam Neeson over here fighting wolves. <laughs> so, as such, it, it has to make sense unto the characters they've written for the show. Well, what do you mean it has to make sense, for example? Well, the characters are written into the show. They all make choices, and each choice becomes its own choice, and each choice has to make its its own sense for that particular choice. Huh? You just said choice like five times. I'm so <laughs> lost. Can you get a little clearer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, all right, let's put it this way. You, you have to write it for people that have not read the books. Yes, okay. okay? And I understand that you, you have... You, you have it written for people who have read the books, but the show itself has to operate under the premise that the... They haven't. They haven't yet. They have So, for example, in, in this episode's case, the show can't be lopsided to Jamie the entire time. It has to show a clear understanding of both Jamie and Frank. And that way... While we may not necessarily agree with Claire's choice to eventually run back to the 1940s during this episode, or her anguish once she arrives back in the 1940s in season two, Mm -hmm. spoiler alert, Hmm. we can at least understand her reasoning for the choices and the emotional responses she has at at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Jelly bean, I do. So when we last talked about... um, drama and choices you didn't and- laugh you said you know what i mean and i said jelly bean <laughs> <sighs> yes Sorry. quite funny quite funny continue when we last talked about uh black jack randall which by the way go back if you haven't listened to it the the study on black jack randall and why he is the perfect villain for outlander correct um we did talk about drama and struggle and choices and what they all meant for the villain and for the main character. And in that, we arrived at this point. The more personal the story becomes, it results in more drama. And so we feel more attachment to either side. More attachment means a more compelling struggle. And if we have a highly compelling struggle, then we are privy to a highly entertaining show. So put it this way. Imagine you are somewhere stuck between two men. Okay. Okay. I'm going to give you this. Oh my God. Who who do I get to be stuck between? This uh, is so awkward and yet exciting. Jake Gyllenhaal and um, who else? Oh, here we go. I got it. Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. That's who you get. Oh my God. It- <laughs> <laughs> Those two. <laughs> <laughs> you know me so well. Th- that's the problem. You know me so well. <laughs> Mary has a crush on the Prime Minister of Canada. I am not alone, I hope. Oh my I God. hope. Well, all right. So you, my darling, my Justin, love, Justin, all the way. You are stuck between Jake Gyllenhaal okay, and Justin bad. Trudeau. Yep, I'll sign okay. me up. A. Two men that have fallen madly in love with, with you and you them. A. One that is dreamy. <laughs> A. <laughs> and seems... To fulfill every single one of your needs. Oh my God, like maple syrup. <laughs> Is there maple syrup in Canada because it's near yes. New Hampshire? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Except, of course, when you're nearly raped and have to fend your for yourself oh. in a meadow. <laughs> no, yeah, no thank you. And um, one who isn't as dreamy. Jake Gyllenhaal, okay. But you promised to yourself you would get back to at all costs. I mean, yes. The one man who you longed for for over six years during a war you didn't choose to create. Oh my God, he's so dreamy and Spider-Man and nerdy, yes. Well, he's not Spider-Man, that's Tobey oh, Maguire. Tobey, f- Jake is... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'm getting at is this. How about if there's three men who are... <laughs> okay, fine, me? <laughs> three men. And Tobey Maguire is the other one, okay? <laughs> he's such a nerd. <laughs> so three men are, lo- are in love with you and you're in love with them. And but, I'm, I'm on the outs. But Justin Trudeau is my Jamie. But Justin Trudeau is your Jamie. <laughs> okay. okay. Wouldn't this be the hottest choice you've ever made? Honestly, think about that. Like, wouldn't this, like, 
this would, you would have to talk about this. This would be the only thing that you'd be thinking of constantly, right? Where's Claire's therapist? All the co-pays. All the co-pays. So what I'm getting at is this. That choice, that struggle, the thing that you think about all day, every day, Justin Trudeau or Jake Gyllenhaal or Tobey Maguire or your 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 lackluster, fat, dumpy husband. Stop it. Okay? That choice, that struggle is the very fabric of this show, Outlander. Right? Um. And yet, like, really, how hard is that struggle? I know, but but think about that, though. Like, you, you be thinking about that constantly. Yes. It's the one bit of drama that we can all relate to, that choice, that, that pang of, I need to be with this person. Well, but Ron and Anna did, like, something very interesting. You know what I mean? Like, they made us care about the other guy. Well, that's right. And they earn that choice because they gave the screen time to Frank. Right. They subverted That's what they did. all of our expectations in episode eight, which again, which is the midpoint for the whole first season by giving time to Frank, which is when you think about it is crazy, but for crazy, now, crazy, and yet it totally worked like that <laughs> blew not only show watchers minds, but book readers minds. Right. Well, for now, though, let's take a quick break and uh, I want to talk about our sponsor, Storyworth, real quick. Imagine having a way to preserve stories from a loved one so that you and future generations could enjoy them. Like getting families together every week so they can get to know each other better. Well, that's what StoryWorth is. They email your certain somebody a story prompts, questions that you never thought to ask before. And um, they reply to the email with their story or they can record it over phone if they don't feel like typing it. Mm-hmm. All stories are completely private and only share with the family that you choose. And after a year, these stories are bound in a beautiful keepsake book so you can connect with your family. It's a great way to stay in touch, you know, bridge those geograph- geographical uh, distances, learn different things about your relatives. Um, you can have entertaining or surprising or sometimes really moving responses. And the best part is you get to res- preserve these memories. Pass on these treasures to your children and the future families. I love it. Right. I, I Actually, I did one for my dad because uh, this was going to be a great Father's Day gift uh, for him. And I told the story about him getting pulled over by the cop in the last episode. Yes. And reading the paper and the cop knew him and let him go. Uh, I, I never would have known that if I didn't have story work. Yep. It's and, so, so good. And I, it, it's a great present. It's something that you can just you, you can you can get last minute for father's day or or a mother's day that just passed or whatever any other holiday that's come up you can get that without just with, by just clicking a button online well you know what the button's going to be it's going to be storyworth.com slash outlander you're going to save twenty dollars when you subscribe once again storyworth.com slash outlander all right so now let's get back to frank right here real quick okay i i cannot understate this choice and like <laughs> this choice of uh, like the, the impact that this choice has on the story is immense when you think about the the previous two episodes being so Jamie and BJR and Claire heavy it's easy to get caught up in wanting to further explore their travails of course it, it Scotland itself is intoxicating as it is especially when you see the beautiful shots of Claire and Jamie on the ridge <sighs> is this normal or when <laughs> Or when Forrester pans out to show the huge scope of the story and the Fraser love and it focuses on just our title. Like that one scene when she pans out and she has the one tree and they have the shadows and oh my goodness gracious. It's easy to get caught up in those. (laughs) You can forget about Frank. But dedicating more than half of this episode to Frank is is really, I again, nothing short of monumental in my opinion. Because it subverts our expectations and thrusts upon us a man who we have, we have all been led to assume is not an entirely vital. Yeah, to, except to the this story. episode makes him real. It that, makes us that's care what I'm about saying. him. And it actually turns him into a person. One we can all relate to given his grief, his his, his broken heart, and the, the sheer desperation to find the one person who makes him whole again. Oh, Frank, he needs a hug. 
Again, this is coming from a show watch, watcher's perspective, so I, I, I can't comment as to you know what nothing, happens Snow. later on in the books with Frank. But as of right now, the guts that it takes to show Frank in the police station going back and forth, being led on by criminals only to beat them down and his struggles with the Reverend Wakefield, it actually makes Frank a sympathetic character within the context of this show at that very moment in time. I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, he's longing for his lost wife. Yep. Um, he even struggles to open her suitcase and, uh, uh, you know, looks at a picture of she and he. And the show is telling you that entire episode that Frank truly, 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 truly loves Claire. And do you believe, like, even as a book watch, book reader, do you believe this? I mean, he is not the king of men. No, but do you believe that he loves Claire? Yes. And that the anguish yes. that he has is real? Yes. Good. Yes. Mission accomplished. Done. That's what they. That's what they did. No, he is not the king of men. He, he He's even pretty much a little nerd boy for the most part. I love nerd boys. Who, <laughs> obviously, Justin Trudeau over here, who... He he has a streak of his ancestors' blood of Black Jack Randall as he literally beats down the people who tried to steal his money. By the way, I, still I would have done the same thing. I still love that shot of him with the blackjack. <laughs> yes, just nailing these people and his eyes widening. I know and... that everyone got like really like, ooh, Frank, but like, wouldn't you? Yes. Wouldn't you do that? I like, like that was Frank being like super smart, Frank. That's like spy Frank. Yes. When they're like, oh yeah, hey, meet me behind the bar. At, at like after midnight yes. and bring all the money and, and come alone. Like this is like as you said, this is spy Frank. This isn't just like some jabroni. Right. It's who, not. It's not me. Oh, it's not Justin Trudeau <laughs> going out there and uh, trying. Justin would not carry a blackjack. No, right? he, he. No, he wouldn't. But regardless, he's still tied to Claire. Is what you're trying to say? Like, there's still. Yeah. There's he, still a lot to him that has worth. Right. He is worthy of Claire. Oh yes. And because he is worthy of Claire, then he is worthy of the viewer. Mm -hmm. Because remember, like I said, as Claire is staring out into the mist at those rocks, for that one moment, we are Claire as well. Yep. So because he is worth our time, when, when Mrs. Grant tells him the story about the travelers, which ties our story all the way back to the premiere. Mrs. Graham. We secretly want him to believe her. And we want him to believe her, maybe because it would finally give him relief in a situation that he has no control over. Maybe maybe even some of us want him to find Claire. And maybe there is even the rare group of people that are out there that want them to be back together. Who are those people? People like me. You what? <laughs> I'm Team Frank. I always have been. I always will be. Okay. Well, nonetheless, we see Frank driving past Craig Nadoon. How do you say it? Craig Nadoon. How do you say it for real? Craig Nadoon. It's not like Cock Nam and Rock. Oh, it was Cock Nam and Rock that, yeah. <laughs> we, we see that, we, yeah, we, you're right. We do see him drive past Craig Nadoon eventually. And we see that motorcycle zip past him on the road. Remember that? It kind of, it like jerked him awake to yes. the realization that he has nothing left to lose, but to go check it out. I mean, what the hell? Why not? We have the emotional buildup with Frank that both he and we deserve. Mm -hmm. Maybe as he goes to Craig Nadoon, this man is healed. Maybe his story is over. Maybe, I mean, who knows? Maybe it all works out in the end for Frank as he looks at Craig Nadoon and walks up to those stones. Oh my God, but then you have Bear McCurry's music and you're like, nope, never mind, <laughs> never mind. I'm but, totally still emotional. But we spent enough time with him seeing his resolve to find his wife that as that music comes up and serenades us into this sweeping atmospheric love Ugh. that only Frank and Claire and Jamie and all these people can have, we watch his face fill with hope as he hears Claire, his Frank. love, call out Frank. his name. And of course, not only do we have a reason for Claire to finally touch the stones, Frank. thank God, and want to travel through them, but we also have Frank, a, 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 a literally a physically beaten tired, emotional, and desperate Frank calling out her name. And Claire actually hears it too. Even more reason for Claire to touch the stones, unlike the premiere. Yes. So we're being told, like, 
There's some love here, guys. Right. The, the, their the Frank love, hate has to stop. It, it's not that it doesn't have to stop. It's just that you kind of got to let up a little bit. Because the show, the, not me, I'm not saying this, but the show is telling you that their love, for Frank and Claire, is strong enough indeed to traverse through time and, and, and space itself. I'm not saying it. Fact, not opinion. Mm-hmm. The show is. But we, as we're watching it, get the sense that this is everything that we've built towards the yes. whole season. Whole half season. But yes. yes. We've, yeah, so far, what we've watched. Okay, what yes, do you mean? We've gotten rent. Mm-hmm. We've spent time at the gathering. Yes. We've even discovered the truth about Jamie's relationship to the garrison commander. But think of where we have come from in the beginning. A woman disappears. Her husband left to discover. People disappear all the time. All the while, she's taken root with another man, and they get married. That's one way to say it, taken root. Yeah, yeah, you gave her some root, all right. And we are left to watch the dread, the love, the hope, and the hopelessness of disper- disturbing the space-time continuum, really, when you look at it. Mm. Everything that we have watched, uh, this episode could legitimately be a sequel, almost, to direct sequel to Sassanak. I mean, you have the guys out on out on the horses. We, we could forego rent. We could forego the gathering, really. Where we are at the beginning of both sides now. You just cut out the whole BJR and the, the, the hardcore only th- love. The, the only thing you need you, the wedding. The only thing you can't let go of is you can't let go of Garrison Commander. Why not? Because you For need to episode? know- this episode? Yeah, you need to know the story behind uh, him and Jamie. Oh, okay. Then you need you need that second time that they met, okay? Mm-hmm. And you also need the wedding, okay? Because Jamie and Claire are married. So you're saying those four episodes? Those are four what episodes are most essentially important. are what we have really come for here. Yes. Okay. So we have done all of that, and because of that, this is what this 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 moment in the space time continuum between Claire and Frank. Mm-hmm. This is what earns that moment on the ridge as Claire stands, stares at the stones. Yes, she has Jamie. Yes, all seems well. But throughout the whole first half of the season, she is lulled into a false sense of security. Once again, that's a good way to put it, lulled. <laughs> so what makes this story even more impactful, really? Claire is suddenly put in a spot where she is once again, well, she is in grave danger. She wasn't even Sassanak wasted. She was about to be raped by deserter redcoats in front of Jamie, oh. no less. Yeah. And there's nothing that he could do about it. Yep. There's nothing. And this, like Claire looking out at the stones, is a moment mm-hmm. for she and Jamie. Of course, we all know the end result. She stabs the red coat in the kidneys thanks to her relatively convenient lessons she was granted by Angus just the, the day before. But this is the moment. This is when Claire realizes that she is not safe. Not even Jamie can protect her all of the time. And now she has killed. It's a moment that resonates because all we had thought about Scotland, Jamie, and even Claire, is now upended. Is Claire the woman she thought we thought, uh, we thought that she was? I mean, Claire is a healer, not a killer, right? At least not to this point in the now show. Now she is. Now she's like Romeo, a little murdering lover. <laughs> Jamie may be the king of men, but he, is he worth losing oneself? Is... She Claire Randall, the nurse? Meh. Or is she Claire Fraser, the killer? Meh. Who does she want to be? Who do we want her to be? And most important of all, who do we want to be? Mary Larson. <laughs> so it pits the show watchers and the book readers against each other, but also... Against themselves, respectively. Okay, how come? Is Claire's life worth the comfort of a man who loves her but isn't her soulmate soulmate and frank? Or is it worth being in constant danger, bound to upheaval at any given second due to the instability and the unease of the time, just to fulfill her soul-captivated bond with Jamie? Which one would be a more exciting multi-book series? 
Um, well, that, that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> I know. I'm joking. <laughs> but who do we want her to be? And, and Claire, at that moment, who is she? And that's why it keeps going back to that, right? So Claire, of course, makes her choice. She wants to be wants easy to going go life back. with Frank. She wants to go back to Frank, only to be have it be ripped away by Redcoats. And Frank has his heart ripped away at the same time. He mm. leaves defeated and, and, and disgusted and, and devoid of all that makes him warm inside. That's what she said. <laughs> Actually, this was the episode where the first "that's what she said" joke was ever given by Rupert when <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when he, they talk about how the 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 knife was too long and <laughs> too heavy for her to handle. He's like, "Yeah, that's what she said." <laughs> oh, glad I threw that back in there. Then, oh my god, that's funny. Okay, so um, and 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 well, here here's the really cool thing that I always uh-huh. loved about this episode. To further further highlight that transition, um, uh, with Frank and being dejected and and Claire being ripped away from the stones, and 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 the, the emotional gathering, the build up of watching them both run up those hills and bears sweeping music and the in the in camera light effects that Anna Forster uses as she's transitioning from the 1740s to the 1940s and back and forth and both hearing them both call their names out and the birds coming out and 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 then Claire putting her hands up to the the stones and cut to black to further highlight this transition of her getting ripped away instead of Frank Claire now gets to be party to his evil ancestor and alter ego in Black Jack Randall. And of course she played she does play cat and mouse with him and he her citing how she knows the Duke of Sandringham and that his that's her employer too and we all know that Black Jack is rarely outsmarted and he is rarely out of control. Yeah. So it all of course comes crumbling down when Black Jack Randall simply tricks Claire once again using a fake Mrs. Sandringham as bait. She fell for it. Because Claire just doesn't know when to shut the hell up. We watch that tension play out, just as it did with the raid on the horses and the gold during the scene with our favorite Highlanders and their thieves. Remember when Rupert's telling the story and everyone's getting their their swords out and and, never breaks pitch whatsoever. It was beautiful. It's slow, Mm -hmm. this scene, just like the Rupert scene. It's methodical. It's it's purposeful. And we know what's going to happen. We know there's going to be a battle. Yes, there's going to be bloodshed somehow. It's just how much time that can be spread out before one of the outcomes take place. How much time do we have before the thieves come out? How much time do we have before Blackjack dominates Claire? We know what's going to happen. Okay, but we still know what's going to happen. We know what's going to be the result. Right. Uh, but we but, don't really have any control over it. And that is the point. Because when it happens, why it happens, or how it happens, is the ultimate exercise in tension. Yet another thing, another factor that makes this one of the perfect episodes of Outlander. And so when we have it suddenly relieved... And then reinvigorated by the Mrs. Sandringham con- commentary that's that Blackjack uses, mm-hmm. it's just icing on the cake. It it takes it and it spreads it out even more. And while Claire ties Blackjack Randall's scarf around his neck, you remember that? Yes. Or while Blackjack ties the rope around his hand and doesn't react one ounce as Claire screams out for help, we see why Anna Forster is the perfect match for Outlander. Come back, Anna. <laughs> she highlights a perfect example of chemistry, a perfect example of show, not tell. Maybe season four, Anna? Perfect direction. A perfect scene. It really is. That that final scene with Blackjack Randall and Claire. Claire screams out. Jamie hears it, jumps through the window to declare B, to, to BJR, I thank you to take your hands off my wife. Cut to black. And then that's the end of the episode. I mean... And it's so crazy to think about what was covered in the episode. There was rape, love, complete confusion. Right. We start in one way, all lovey-dovey. Right. Yay, so happy. And we end completely in a different way. Right. Like, she's torn apart from both lovers. For just that episode, we have that one little story. 
But we also have a complete story for the first half, one of self-discovery and destinies crossing cosmic paths for Claire and Blackjack Randall and Jamie and Frank. This is our arc. And yet I still want to know more and I want to know what's to come. Right. So our conflict now after this is set up for the rest of the season between Claire, Jamie and Blackjack Randall. And we have resolved why Claire might be better off with Jamie as opposed to Frank. But we're also left with a deep regret for a defeated Frank, one who walks off with nothing, one who has to show or has at least nothing to show for all of his efforts, and a man who didn't necessarily deserve any of these problems, at least, again, according to the show. Yes. And we are also left with an episode that is nearly a perfect episode of Outlander, a perfect mid-season finale, and a perfect tension point for those to binge it as well. Lucky ducks that they are. I remember when we first watched this episode and when we did our original episode on it, I was a little harsh on it. Yeah. And I think that harshness was probably undue. Um, I concur. Because knowing what I know now, yes, I was a little frustrated with the Claire and Jamie stuff. Like, I got frustrated with the training scene. Uh, I got frustrated with the stuff with Human Row and the Dragonfly and Amber thing and setting up Horrix. And I, like, I got frustrated with it because it just felt like stuff. It felt like stuff was happening to move plot. Mm -hmm. Like they needed to get Claire to the stones. And how the hell do we do that? Well, let's create this this conflict or whatever. And it makes sense. But the overall scope of what this episode created and what it resulted in, I think, was the perfect match for what Outlander needed at the mid-season point. I agree. So that is our in-depth analysis of both sides now. now. My darling, anything else you have to say uh, about this beautiful episode of Outlander? It truly was beautiful on so many levels. Yes, it was. I just wish we had Anna Forrester back. (laughs) And if you guys listen to this before you've rewatched it, go and rewatch it. Yeah, why not? I, I had a lot of fun rewatching it. Yeah. I, I really did. I was taking notes and I was going crazy with it. And uh, I, I forgot how much joy I had during this episode. Yes. So uh, are you ready to close out our Emmy Award winning episode of Outlander Cast? Yes. All right, let's do it. We want to personally welcome you all and invite you all to our exclusive Facebook group, the Outlander Cast Clan Gathering. This is the place to be, guys, especially during Droughtlander, but even as the season finally kicks off, we have amazing discussions. This is where our bloggers from around the world for the Outlander Cast blog share excitement. We're doing a read along led by our associate editor. Janet Reynolds on Voyager. So, guys, seriously, go to Facebook and search Outlander Cast Clan Gathering. Join the clan. What are you waiting for? (laughs) And, hey, if you liked this episode and you want more of it, or, hey, if you you think it sucked and you're like, Blake, stop doing this kind of stuff, uh, and and Mary, too, uh, please get in touch with us uh, via social media uh, on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Uh, whatever the hell we have, we, we got it all. Our handles there are all the same. It's just Outlander Cast. And if those uh, media aren't enough for you and you need to send a long message, please email us at outlandercast at gmail.com. And if you, again, if you do like this episode and you think we provide enough of a value to your Outlander experience, please consider becoming a patron of Outlander Cast by donating a, a dollar or two or $125 billion. It's, it's entirely up to you. Um, th- that help does help uh, get our costs down to create this show. But it also helps me be able to read the book. Uh, a lot of people have asked me, Blake, why have you not read the book Outlander yet? And I vowed to, to never read them. Although every man's pride and every man's soul has a price. Uh, and my price would be $650 per month for me to read the first book of Outlander. And we are almost there. 
Uh, and if you help contribute to the Patreon um, account there, I will read the first book. And for patrons only, I will do a chapter by chapter Yay! analysis. Uh, and we'll have fun with it. Keelan D on iTunes left a great review saying, Great podcast and all things Outlander. Mary and Blake are a great husband and wife team who digest and discuss and help us all process and absorb this incredible world that Diana Gabaldon has created for all of us to get lost in. Oh. Blake hasn't read the books, but hoping that will change very soon as he starts to read the first book at least. <laughs> Though I don't always agree with Blake's assessment and reviews, Team Frank. Seriously, yes, I do team appreciate Frank. the time and thought and thorough history lessons he has provided throughout oh. the first two seasons thank you mary keep on keeping on don't let him give up on reading and i look forward to sharing season three with you all keep up the history lessons those are insightful too and thank you for all you do to expand the outlander universe so thank you keelan thank you no one's girl blooming girl and dandy delamade they've all recently written on itunes i would love for more of you to write a review on itunes right. so it can be read here this is so important for us to continue to let the outlander cast word get out to more podcast listeners so thank you guys find us in the clan gathering if this was um great please 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 think about becoming a patron little goes such a long way it really uh helps us keep on going and until then you can find us at alandercast.com and that's about it so for now i'm mary larson my name is blake and you've been listening to outlandercast <laughs>